happy to be here. And I want to talk about God's wrath because I don't think it's a well understood subject at all, especially if we want to share it to people who are not Christian, like in Thailand, um, where 95% of people are Buddhist. And the idea of a perfect being having wrath is very odd or being angry because anger uh, seems to be a human emotion. And usually like the monks, for example, they want to be above wrath or above anger. So what does it mean? How, what does it mean is wrath and does God have loving wrath and how does that work? When I was uh, young, I, you know, I, I didn't grow up Christian and I didn't have any Christian friends. I was very secular and I had Buddhist friends. And we loved to play a, a card game called Magic the Gathering. And there was one card that was a really strong card. It, 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 we had to pay money for it to, to get it. You want it in your deck. And it was called Wrath of God. That was the first time I ever heard, I ever heard of Wrath of God because I'm not Christian. So I was like, oh, this is a Wrath of God card. And look what it does. It says it destroys all creatures and they can't be regenerated, right? So that was Wrath of God. And, and it was a good card. What you would do is it would destroy everything, including your own, your own creatures. So it wasn't that good. But what you would do is you let the other person play their creatures. Then you would play that card, destroy everything. And then you would play your own creatures. So it would clear the board and then you would take over. And you can see that the picture they have of God on this left one is, you know, this angry wrath of God. And he destroys everything. Or this one is like, I don't know what it is on the right side. It's like a, a meteor or a sun. It's just the apocalypse. And so that's the wrath of God. And that's pretty scary. That's what God's wrath is. And the thing is, like, when you don't actually study the Bible and you don't, see how the word is used your imagination can just it just plays tricks on you it can just think whatever it wants about the wrath of god and it's not it's not biblical it's not scriptural um it's just it's just your own ideas because everybody has an idea of god even when i did not believe in god i still knew of the concept of god okay he's supposed to be the creator i don't know if he exists but i i guess he's angry and and, and uh what does that mean what does that mean when he's angry here are some sort of scary verses. Um, I will execute great vengeance upon them with furious rebukes, and they shall know that I am the Lord when I shall lay my vengeance upon them. It's just another example of, whoa, you read that. I remember when I first read the Bible and I was like, whoa, all right, all right. You know, I kind of, weirdly enough, I kind of liked that, um, especially because I thought that God would do vengeance on bad people not me of course i'm good that's kind of my well that was my understanding here's another verse god is jealous and the lord revenges the lord revenges and is furious the lord will take vengeance on his adversaries and he reserves wrath for his enemies it's like yeah you don't want to mess with this god and each of these things i believe needs to be analyzed carefully um in the scriptures to compare what it means and um, revenge, je what does it mean when God is jealous? Um, what does it mean when he takes vengeance? I won't focus on those things. I'm just going to focus on, on what it means when he's angry and he's wrathful. But I think, I believe there's deep lessons for us in all those things because jealousy doesn't, doesn't sound good when you say God is jealous. So like, what does that mean? Well, we know clearly this as God is love. And sometimes it can be hard to fit God being love with these prior verses. And I know that a lot of us who have to work with non-Christians, they will have very difficult questions for us. Like at the uh, Adventist school here in Thailand, the whole school is Buddhist. And they're always asking things like, well, if God is love, why is he burning people? Or if God is love, like, why does, why does some people have to go to hell? And da, da, da. Difficult questions. Why, why is he getting jealous? Like, isn't jealousy like not good? Things like that. This is important text I want us to remember. It's from Isaiah 55, 8. I'm, sh I'm guessing that Obadiah has already shared this. Oops. And um, 
It says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. So this is warning us that the way God thinks is not the way we think. And the way he, his ways are not our ways. So when he says he's jealous, that means it's going to be some, at least somewhat different. We don't know how different, but it's going to be different in some sense to us being jealous. Right? Because his jealousy is different than our jealousy. His ways are different than our ways. When he says he's angry, his anger is going to be different to our anger. And we want to see how that is. Another question that comes up is that all these natural disasters that are happening around us, are those God's wrath? Like, is he angry at people? Like, is there a, is there a reason why disasters happen someplace and not others? And, and those are hard questions. There was the famous story. I mean, there's many, I'm sure people have heard things like this, but there was the famous story of the, the huge hurricane in America, Hurricane Katrina. This was like 10 years ago. Hurricane Katrina hitting New Orleans and it just totally destroyed the whole city of New Orleans in the South. I mean, New Orleans is a famous musical city that allows a lot of drinking and partying. And, and a lot of pastors were saying, oh, God was angry at New Orleans because they're all um, homosexuals and, you know, just having lots of free sex and all. Is that true? But what happens when a disaster happens to our church or happens to us? Is, you know, is, that, is he angry at us? And that's kind of scary to think like that he's going to, like when we have a car accident, did like God do that? Like, how does that work? Or things like that. So I'm not going to answer all these questions, but I just want us to, to think about. Interestingly enough, the first story where it says that God is angry He's actually angry at Moses, which is weird because you would think that he would be angry at, you know, his enemies or Gentiles or non-believers, not Moses, the, you know, one of people who actually believes in him and is like his friend. And I was thinking about this. Is, is it really the first time? And it's true, like about the flood, it says that God was grieved. He was sad of for what the people did. He didn't say he was angry. And then for the Tower of Babel, it just says that he'll change the languages. And then Sodom and Gomorrah, it just says that um, he hears a cry from Sodom and Gomorrah and he'll go see what the cry is. But it doesn't say he's angry. But here it says he's angry. So I, I wanna look at this story carefully because um, when we wanna understand something, we wanna look at, of course, if we wanna understand God's wrath fully, or God's anger. You want to look at every verse that talks about his anger. But particularly you want to look at the, the first time and the last time. That can be very helpful. So in this story, uh, God comes to Moses in the, the burning bush. And, you know, he says, he, Moses, here I am. Take off your shoes. And I've seen the affliction and I'm going to go deliver them, deliver the Israelites from slavery. And I will, um, I will send you to Pharaoh. So I will send you, Moses. This is in Exodus 3, verse 10. I will send you to Pharaoh that you will bring the people out of Egypt. And how does Moses respond? He says, who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? So Moses is like, oh, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. Right. That's, Mo that's Moses' reaction. And then verse 12, God says, certainly I will be with you. And this shall be a token to thee that I've sent thee. When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on Mount. So God assures him. He says, look, I'm, I'm going to be with you. You can do it. And when you come out, we'll be, we'll be together on the mountain. And, um, but Moses still doubts. He says, but when I come, They'll ask me, what is, what, is your, what is his name? What is God's name? And God says, oh, I am. You'll, you'll tell them, I am that I am. And uh, you know, I'll tell them that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And I'm, I'm fulfilling the promise made to them. Da, 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 da. And he, he gives all these assurances that he's God. And he's, he's the same God that 
has been with Abraham. That's all the chapter three until the end of chapter three. And then Moses answers and says, but behold, they will not believe me. They will not listen to me. They will say the Lord has not appeared to you. So Moses is still not going to do it, right? He, he's still not going to, he's like, no, they're not going to believe me. He still doesn't want to do it. Then God says, what's in your hand? A rod, you know, take the rod, throw it on the ground. It becomes a snake and you take it back, catch it. It becomes a, a, a rod again. And then, so he's trying to show Moses, look, I'm God. Like, I'll, I'll be with you. Why are you being scared? Look, look, I, we, could, we could do these miracles and you could show them. You show them this miracle, they'll believe it. I'm with you. And then um, he does the other miracle about the hand going to the bosom. It becomes leprous. Okay, we're, we're getting to the point now. So this is Exodus 4, verse 10. And Moses responds, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither... So I'm not good at speaking. I'm slow of speech and have a, be a slow tongue. And then God said, who made man's mouth? And who makes the dumb, the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? Now go. Said, go, and I will be with your mouth, and I will teach you what you will say. And he said, and Moses responds. So you think Moses is surely going to go, right? I mean... They've been having this conversation for a while. And then Moses says, nope. He says, send, I pray you, by the hand of someone else. I'm begging you, send someone else, God. And this is where God first gets angry. It's really interesting. This is the longest that God has ever talked to anybody in the Bible so far. Right? I think in Genesis, God has not had an extended conversation with any human like this. So the first time that God comes and meets a human and just extensive, long conversation. And, and what is the, how does the human react? No, no, no. I don't want to do it. No. Said somebody else. So this, this shows us what uh, we are like. right? And it also shows that God is not necessarily doesn't necessarily get angry at people who don't know him. You know, what would he get angry with? He got angry with Moses. He got angry with the person that he shows great love to, great light to, who he tries to talk to, but is just like keeps rejecting, like doesn't want to do it. And so it says the Lord, the anger of the Lord was kindled and anger. The word anger means nostrils. And it means to breathe rapidly, like, <laughs> like this sort of, that's the Hebrew, you know, you know, God's using, of course, the Hebrew language doesn't, yeah, um, but it's, that's just interesting, interesting point that uh, he has this passion. It's kindled against Moses. And he says, is not Aaron, the Levite, your brother. I know that Aaron can speak well. And also behold, Aaron comes forth to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. And you shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. And I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach you what you shall do. And Aaron shall be your spokesman unto the people. And he shall be even to you a mouth. And thou shalt be to him a God. This is interesting. What does this mean? It means that God's original plan was not to have Aaron. Right? He doesn't mention anything about Aaron before. It's only when Ab Moses begs God to send someone else that God says, fine, Aaron will help you. So what's God's wrath here? What's the result of God's wrath? Was God's wrath like, you know, we would expect that like, um, it would say the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. He was angry at Moses, and then he shot a bolt of lightning and killed Moses. You know, that's, if that's how I was writing the story, you know, especially when I wasn't a Christian, that's what I would expect to happen. Like, you don't want to do this? I'm honoring you this much? You don't want to do it? Then get out of my sight. Like, you're, let me, I'll just choose someone else. Moses, you're just useless. Like, but he doesn't do that. He says, fine. 
I still gonna, I'll, I'll, I still want to use you, Moses, but I will, I will give you someone else to help you, your brother, Aaron. So what, what is God's wrath here? God's wrath is to give us what we want. That is not good for us. It would have been better if Moses had did this by himself. We don't know why, but it would have, because that was God's first plan. It's not God's plan to have Aaron. And we know that that's true because later on, what does Aaron do? Aaron makes the golden calf, right? Because of Moses saying, I need someone else to help me. God says, fine, have Aaron. And that leads to big, big problems, big problems. So it wasn't, it wasn't God's per ideal plan to do it that way. So this is God's wrath. When we won't listen to him, he gets frustrated because he knows what's best for us, but we won't do it and we won't do it. And then he's like, fine, what will it take for you to do it? And then Moses, somebody else. And so God says, okay, we'll try it. We'll do it. We'll do things your way and I'll try to make it work. And God can still make it work, but there's more pain. It's more difficult. So that is a, the first example of God's wrath. It's uh giving, in this case, giving Moses what he wanted, um, which he's willing to work with, but it's not his ideal plan. Um, the, next, the next story I want to get to is this story, which is when the people of Israel, they come out of Egypt and they're, oh, you know, God wants to kill us in the wilderness. Did God bring us out to die? And Moses, we don't trust you. you. You want us to die. You're going to take our money. So this is the attitude of the Israelites. Just like Moses. I mean, but worse. They don't trust God. And of course, I want everyone to understand that this reflects us, right? This is human nature. We don't want to say like all oh, the stupid Jews. We want to, this is humans. We don't trust God. We're scared if we, we, we think that he's going to take us out and you know, lead, us, lead us and just leave us. Um, that's just, that's just part of having a sinful nature, a sinful mind that doesn't trust God. But yeah, that's what they thought. They thought, oh, we're, we don't have any food out here and we miss the, the food in Egypt, even though they were, you know, they were complaining about being slaves. We want meat. We want this, we want quail. And, um, so that's in, this is in numbers, numbers 11. I'll just read this. It says, they were weeping, they were crying. It says, who shall give us flesh to eat? Then Moses heard the people weeping and every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. So yeah, God was angry again. So what does God do? And there went forth a wind from the Lord and brought quails from the sea. So there's a wind and he brings birds. Okay, it's like, you want unhealthy food to eat? Take it. Here. Here's, this, is, this is what you want, these birds. And he let them fall by the camp, as it were, a day's journey. And, so, and he just gives them a lot of quail. Notice, they are free to take as much as they want. They could have just taken a little bit. But when they, but he, but. There was time, it was stacked up piles of quail and everybody was just freaking out. They just had an orgy of quail and just fee ha la la. I mean, I wonder if they even cooked it, you know, they're so hungry because, you know, people eat, you know, sometimes the, the taste of raw food is really good, you, you know, and you miss that meat, you get, you're getting hungry. Maybe they just, ah, just feeding on that raw. Uh, we don't know what happened. We don't know how they cooked it, but we do know that right after this, there was a plague. And it's my impression that the plague was caused by their decision to eat this food, probably not cook it enough because they were hungry. Maybe they cooked it just a little bit. They didn't, they had it rare, medium rare, too rare. So they got sick. Did God want them to get sick? No, he doesn't want anybody to get sick. He wants them to be happy. He wants them to trust him and love him. But they want quail, they're crying, they're crying. So God gives them what they want and then they overdo it and they get sick and some die because of the plague and we blame God. But it's, but 
God's not to blame. So this is a second example of God's wrath. And once again, it's giving people what they want. And the thing is, why is God angry about giving people what, what they want? He, God wants to give us what we want, but he doesn't want to give us bad things that we want. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want, if we're like, please, I just got, I'll do anything for a cigarette. Just please, Father, give me a cigarette. Give me a cigarette. Does God want to give us a cigarette? No. But I mean, if we're like, I'd rather die and I don't trust you. You're not a good God. Like prove that you're a good God. Like if you really love me, you would give me one. And God just be like, oh, fine. I'll give you one. But, but he's, he's not happy about it. He's angry. He, 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 he's, he's sad. And uh, I get to that at this point about being sad. And so it's frustrating for him. He has this, it's sad to see his people in pain um, doing what's not good. It's, it's, we're, it's his children. Why are they wanting what's not good for them? Um, the third story is the, the story of Saul where the people are like, oh, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king. And God warns them. He says, it's not good to have a king. A king's going to take your children and make them slaves. He's going to force your boys to be soldiers. He's going to take your daughters uh, to marry. And he's going to tax you. And you're not going to have as much freedom. And so they're like, we don't care. We want a king. A king like the other people. And so God gives them a king. He gives them Saul. And in Hosea, it says, I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. So he gives people what they want, but he also, but they also receive the consequences of that. And the kings would lead Israel into all sorts of apostasy, into all sorts of evil. And um, like because of the kings and, in, Israel, in the northern kingdom of Israel, they were totally destroyed. And so was the Lord. And so was Judah later too. And um, so yeah, that's, a, that's a th third example. So fine. And, and then, notice God still tries to help them though. He says, okay, you run a king. I don't think it's a good idea. But if you really want a king, I'll try to help you pick a king. So he tries to help Saul. You know, he picks a king that they'll accept because they won't just accept any king. They had to pick, he had to pick the most handsome, strong, tall man to be their king for them to unite behind him. That was Saul. And he gives Saul his spirit, tries to help Saul. But of course, Saul doesn't, doesn't do well. And then he tries to help David and he tries to help all the kings. But it, it wasn't the, the ideal system. This is a really interesting story, and I, I just want to go here because if we want if we want to understand what God is like, of course we want to look at all the stories in the Bible, but most particularly we know what God is like by looking at the life that His Son lived on Earth. So, does Jesus ever get angry when he was when Jesus was down here? Did he get angry? And that will help give us a picture of what God the Father is like when he gets angry. And this is from Mark 3, verses 1 to 6. And Jesus entered into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. So the, a man that had a hand that was, yeah, lame and not working. And they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day. That they might accuse him. So the Pharisees are like, is he going to heal somebody on the Sabbath? Is he going to break the Sabbath by healing? And he said unto the man which had, had the withered hand, stand forth. And Jesus said to him, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or do evil? To save life or to kill? Right? So to do good is to save and to do evil is to kill. So he's saying, is it okay to do good on the Sabbath? You know, is it okay to save somebody on the Sabbath? He's looking at the Pharisees. But they held their peace. They didn't answer. They just gave him a stony silence. And this is the part that's important. And when Jesus had looked round about them with anger, 
So now Jesus is angry. Well, how, but then it continues. He looks at them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. He's grieved. He's pained. He's saddened. He's troubled by the hardness of their hearts. Why are you so cold-blooded? Why you have no pity? Don't you feel sorry for this man? You, you don't want me to heal him? You, you think that God doesn't like healing on the Sabbath? Why are you so hard? Why do you understand the Sabbath in this terrible way? Where's your love? Where's your compassion? So he's, he's angry. But here we see the anger is sad. It's, it's passionate. He's this frustrated, passionate sadness and uh, grief, grieved for their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch forth your hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand went forth. And his hand was restored whole as the other. So he heals the hand. And the Pharisees straight away took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. So they see that and they're like, uh-uh. And they start talking to themselves. How are we going to destroy this man? This is terrible, right? I mean, how terrible is this? You know, God has called Israel and he's, he's particularly called the leaders of Israel, the, 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 the religious leaders of Israel to heal and to bless and to take care and to, and to show that God is love. But here they are showing that God is harsh and making his Sabbath uh, a terrible thing. Like the worst day. I mean, you can heal on any other day, but not the Sabbath. That makes the Sabbath the worst day of the week. But Sabbath is supposed to be the best day. It's the day that God is pouring the most blessing out. It's the day that Jesus does the most healings on because there's the most Holy Spirit. It's the most holy day. But here they are saying that what makes God holy is the fact that he will not heal. When Jesus is saying, no, what makes God holy is that he will heal. So he's grieved and he's sad. And that is God's anger. He's grieved that the Pharisees are like this. Just a few more verses, and I, I just, just made, I think I made my point. This is in Romans 1. Paul shows, explains what God's wrath is. He says, God, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Okay? And how is the wrath of God revealed? God gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts. So he he lets them follow their own hearts. They lust after bad things and he gives them up. That's God's wrath. He stops trying to stop them. So if I'm lusting after a, a poison and God's like, don't do it. Don't eat that. That's poison. That's poison. And I'm like, no, no, get away from me, God. I don't, I don't need, I don't want your spirit. I don't want you to tell me anything. Finally, God's, his wrath is to be a fine follow your lust and then become unclean. And of course you will reap what you sow. You will reap the consequences for this cause. God gave them up unto vile affections, right? If you want to, you know, in this case, yeah, you can think of many bad things that humans like to do, especially in the past. If you want to, yeah. Of course, he doesn't want this to happen, but he, he can't force us, right? He can't force us not to do it. He can, he can plead with us. He can beg us not to. But eventually, he has to let us have our own way. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. And we know this is a sin. Like if, if, if the more you, you know, when, the, when you first, for example, I just use cigarettes again. When you first smoke, you know, you're, you know that it's bad and you know this is, i used to smoke cigarettes and you don't like it but the more you smoke the more you like it the more addicted you get and the, the less you feel bad about it or if you steal or if you cheat on your wife at first you feel bad but the more you do it the more it becomes natural the more it becomes who you are and god can't stop you and eventually you're given over to a reprobate mind an unclean mind, a, 
a mind full of lust and evil. So that's God's wrath. And God's wrath is happening to our world because the whole world is rejecting him and pushing him away. And his spirit, as Ellen White says, his spirit is being withdrawn. And the more his spirit is withdrawn, the more we are given over to evil. But we want to show that 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 Jesus in his life, he shows that this is that 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 God doesn't do this and he's like, just forget it. You know, you're, you, I don't care about you. God always cares about people. Even no matter how sinful, no matter how much evil somebody has done, God still cares. And, that, and that's seen in how his son Jesus cries over the city of Jerusalem. He's like, we're crying. He's like, why? Why don't you listen to me? By rejecting me, you're destroying yourself. And so he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. I wanted to bring you to my father, but you wouldn't. You wouldn't come. And now your house is left to you desolate. Now you're doomed. You're going to be destroyed. I have to give you over to the Romans. You chose Caesar instead of Jesus. You chose Caesar instead of God. You want Caesar? You want the Roman Empire? Well, the Roman Empire will destroy you because you annoy them, because you think you're so good. You're not humble. God didn't tell the Romans to destroy the Jews. Their own actions made the Romans hate them. And then God didn't protect them because how can he protect them? He cannot protect those that reject him. That's why Jesus is crying. Right. I just want to end with this point that we may, we don't are never to think that we are forsaken of God. Even if we've done evil, right? So it says here, fear not, this is Isaiah 54, for thou shalt not be ashamed. Don't be confounded or put to shame. Forget what the shame of that youth. So even though I've done bad things in my past, doesn't mean that God is going to give me over to be destroyed. Why? Why would, why does God love me so much that he doesn't give up on me? Like if I keep seeking out God, he will be there. It's only when I, when I give up on God that he's not there. But if I seek him, he will not reject me. Why? For thy maker is thy husband. He's our husband. He wants to marry us. It's up, but do we want to marry him? That's up to us, but he wants to marry us. He's the Lord of hosts. For the Lord has called you as a woman forsaken and grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou was refused, saith God. For a small moment, I have forsaken thee. So when we do evil, God withdraws from us and he lets us have a taste of the bad consequences. But... He doesn't do that to make us lost. He does it so we realize that sin is bad and evil. And and then we're like, oh, no, no. And we'll turn back to him. Because remember, when the Israelites, no matter how much sin they did, when they repented, God accepted them back. He will always accept us back if we repent, if we want him in our life. So with great mercies, I will gather you. In a little wrath, right? In a little anger, I hid my face from you for a moment. But with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on you. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. I swore to Noah that there should no more water go over the earth. So I have sworn that I would not be angry with you, nor rebuke you. I will not be angry with you forever. I, I, if you turn to me, I will always accept you. Everlasting kindness and mercy. Whoops. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, say the Lord that hath mercy on you. Because God has made a covenant with humanity. He will, his kindness will never depart from us. It only departs from us when we fully harden our hearts to reject him, like Pharaoh did in rejecting God. Um, and like when Israel did, rejecting Jesus. But for us, we, we should never, ever, ever think, because we made that decision. It's up to us to, to decide that, 
God is always there willing, like the prodigal son. He's always willing to receive us back if we would go back to him. So that's, uh, because that's, that's the covenant he's made with us. So that is his everlasting kindness. And just lastly, the last slide here, I just want to share this is, I, I got this material from this book called Acts of Our General God. You can download it. It's, it's one of the books that our ministry releases as a PDF. You can download it for free at fatheroflove.info. I took most of this from chapter 13 of this book, What is God's Anger? So if you want that in text, and there's a lot more. You know, when you, when you read, you can get a lot more. Uh, when you talk, it, it, takes, it takes time. But, uh, but yeah, so I also, put wants... it, I also put it in our, uh, in the Google drive link I just shared as well too. Cool. Yeah. So then, and then of course you can see other, other topics. These are just some, why we misread the Bible, how God destroys, how God wages war. And, uh, and I believe this will be a huge blessing to us. I, I, I personally believe that if we want to draw all men to God, these things need to be properly understood and that will lighten the earth with God's glory when we properly understand him and his love. So uh, thank you very much. And thanks for having me.